The following program is sponsored by CBN. Today, a decorated officer. That's the knock of law enforcement. Who is playing both ends of the law. And they say, we have a warrant for your arrest. Why this crooked cop landed behind bars. And you begin to justify things within your mind. And how he came clean. So I'm like, no, I'm done cashing out. On today's 700 Club. Well, surprise, surprise, you thought spring was coming, didn't you? Ha ha, the joke's on all of us. The latest winter storm is the biggest yet. It's hitting 39 states. It's bringing rain, snow, and ice from the Great Plains to the East Coast. Well, it's the latest event in a week of turbulent weather, and it's brought snow to some places where it's seldom been seen. Charlene Aaron has more. The powerful storm is poised to strike some 200 million people beginning today. 39 states, including every state east of the Mississippi, will be affected by the massive storm over the next few days, with snow, sleet, ice, rain, and possibly flooding. Up to six inches of snow or more could fall in some areas of the mid-Atlantic and northeast. So here it comes. Our bursts of snow array arrives late Tuesday night and into Wednesday morning here across northern Virginia, up towards Maryland and southern Pennsylvania. Look at this. We are calling for three to six, perhaps greater than six inches of snow here, six to 12 area, parts of Pennsylvania, Maryland, and West Virginia. So there's going to be a quick burst of heavy snow. And then that will change over to the ice. And that's going to be a big problem here. This week of crazy weather started with snow in Southern California, just north of Los Angeles, closing down I-5 and stranding drivers. We were gonna get a hotel, but there's no more, no more rooms. First time you guys saw snow? For these kids, the oldest of whom is 12, it's the first time they've seen snow. Now we're stuck. So as soon as we got off the exit, we started sliding. So we're just, <laughs> We're stuck in the car. Snow also hit Las Vegas up to two inches, turning the strip into a winter wonderland. Icy and snow covered roads making for hazardous driving conditions in the Midwest and Northeast. The second snowstorm to hit Wisconsin in a week also wreaking havoc on the roads. And east of Kansas City. There's nothing we can do, man. Whiteout conditions caused this nearly 50 car pileup, killing one person. The approaching storm will bring ice and cause power outages in some areas and cancellations of flights out of major airports such as D.C., New York and Boston. Charlene Aaron, CBN News. Well, in addition to all that snow, researchers warm parts of California could see a rare megastorm. This event could dump rain on the area for weeks and scientists say it could cause three times as much damage as a major earthquake. Los Angeles is already seeing warning signs. Engineers say the Whittier Narrows Dam may not be able to handle this much water. If the dam fails, the flooding could threaten, threaten dozens of towns and the lives of one million people in Southern California. Well, Joe Bastardi is the chief forecaster for Accu. Uh, what analytic uh, weather analytics and Joe? It's always good to hear from you. You seem to know what's happening more than anybody else. Hey, it's snowing in Southern California. What's going on? Yeah, it's opposite that song. It never rains in Southern California. Remember that back in the '70s? Well, it snows in Southern California from time to time. As far as uh, Las Vegas goes, their heaviest snowstorm was January 31st, 1979, 18.8 inches. So this is child's play on the strip compared to what has happened before. Of course, back in that time, in the 70s, we heard the Ice Age was coming. Uh, in this particular case, I hear people blaming global warming for snow in Las Vegas right now. But look, this is part of a, a large-scale pattern. I was on, what was it, 10 days ago with that storm there and say, hey, this is going to run into mid-March. I don't see any uh, change in this overall idea of storm after uh, storm and rumors of storms, we call it and plenty of cold air. The cold air of the West right now over the next week will be moving eastward next week and the week after. So March 1st through uh, probably about the 15th, 
going to be very cold in the eastern part of the United States relative to normal. It's going to be a pretty cold, stormy March for much of the country, though I do think the second part of March, instead of waiting until after, you know, April last year, we had to wait till late April, I think the second part of March is going to snap in the east right into spring, uh, maybe by um, uh, before Easter, I would say, this year. Well, Joe, this storm that's coming tonight and tomorrow, how bad is it going to be? Well, it's widespread. It's, it's a... It's a very, very messy storm. It's like, uh, uh, for instance, uh, if you live in the northwest suburbs of D.C. all the way to New York City, back into Pennsylvania, it's going to be like shoveling cement when this is done because it's going to snow four to six inches and sleet on that and then freezing rain on that. And then finally, when the whole all the precipitation is done, the temperature will get to 33, 34 degrees. But it's widespread. It's back into the Midwest. It's hitting a lot of people with light to moderate amounts of snow rather than focused on 100 mile wide area. So uh, it, it's very similar to the storm uh, we had about 10, what was it, seven to 10 days ago. They're all blending together to me where that particular system dumped a, a, a lot of snow, but a lot of sleet and freezing rain also. Well, and by the we, way, we're we, we looking at sunspots. Are we looking at uh, El Nino, La Nina, one of those things in the Pacific? Well, what's what's well, causing this, it? This is a, this is one of, this, you know, there was a, a El Nino in 51, 52, all right, where the southeastern U.S. stayed warm. And I never have been able to track down the reason for that. And it's haunted me all my life. I said, you know, I've talked to my dad. He's a meteorologist. I said, why do you think this happened? Looking at all the maps, I couldn't really figure out why. And that particular uh, lack of knowledge came back to haunt me this winter because this winter with the El Nino that's come on has remained warm in the southeast. We got off to a fast start in December, but it never came back again. So it defied that sort of El Nino mean where the southern and eastern part of the United States get colder. But that being said, we got to go forward with this in the, uh, the El Nino push, if you want to call it that, which tries to push colder air south and east, is going to take over for the next three to four weeks. So we'll get the cold in the west to come southeast. But look, this is nature. If you go back and look at maps, it's like scripture. If you go back and look at the Bible, you find out all different things in there. Well, if you go back and look at weather maps, you see countless examples of things that could give you hints to go forward. The question is, can you figure it out? And Sometimes you can and sometimes you can't. Well, look, the Democrats are talking about this Green New Deal. They think they ought to do away with uh, cows and they ought to do away with airplanes, do away with fossil fuel. Uh, is this being caused by so-called global warming, or uh, is mankind contributing to it? Well, my belief is that mankind, you can't even estimate what mankind does because it's so tiny, all right? You know, I, I, and again, it comes back to upbringing and looking at the maps over the years and understanding that next to the creation, we are nothing. However, if, we, if you believe that you're something and you're something bigger and that you can control these things, you start getting that kind of attitude. Now, here is what I do know, that if this indeed is man doing this, it will be the first time in the recorded history of the planet. And I don't care if you think the planet's 6,000 years old, or God's time, maybe 6,000 years is 10 billion years, who knows? But the, the thing, it'll be the first time that man has ever done this. So I can understand the appeal to people saying, oh, I'm making this discovery that's never happened before. But in the end, Usually what happened before telegraphs what's happening now and is usually the right answer, and that's what I believe. I believe it's mostly nature. Joe, last thing, what's coming up? Any more big storms coming? Yes. Um, a lot of cold, uh, a lot of, I feel like uh, Mr. T and Rocky, pain. <laughs> but a lot of cold, nasty weather into mid-March. Then it'll start retreating back into the West again. And I, I think by Easter, the East is going to be in good shape, okay? So I think mid-March on, this is going to break. But the, the, there's a lot of cold and storminess that will be pushing East, especially next week and the week after before it pulls back again into the West. Joe, thanks for being with us. Joe Bastardi, well, ladies you. and gentlemen, we love him. He's just great. He really all right. is. You know, already in our area, I've seen trees blooming. It's so crazy. Yeah, it's warm well, one day and then they're going to be next. terribly disappointed. Yeah, yes, this they are. Tonight, tomorrow. <laughs> well, up next, she's known as the activist mommy and over 70 million people have watched this vlogger fight to make this country safer for her kids. 
Elizabeth Johnston joins us live when we come back. I tell you, you're going to love our next guest, Elizabeth Johnson. She is a firebrand. She's a social media sensation. Her Facebook views tackle some of the most controversial issues, and they have more than 70 million views. And she says, no way am I going to back down. So a private business owner refuses to bake a same-sex wedding cake because it violates his conscience. And now the couple is claiming they are victims of discrimination. <laughs> Seriously? She's an outspoken Christian mom who isn't afraid to confront the growing hostility against morality in America. In viral Facebook videos, Elizabeth Johnston, better known as the activist mommy, pushes back on issues ranging from abortion and attacks on religious freedom to the problem of gender confusion and the transgender movement. In 2017, her video blasting Teen Vogue for its article promoting deviant sexual practices brought awareness to many parents who had no idea that Teen Fashion Magazine was marketing that agenda to minors. In her new book, Not On My Watch, How to Win the Fight for Faith, Family, and Freedom, Johnston defends the timeless truths of God's Word, encourages other conservatives to leave their closets and boldly unite in fighting for our children, our morals, our freedom, and our culture. The book, ladies and gentlemen, is called Not On My Watch. It's fascinating. I think you'll find it intriguing, and it's available wherever books are sold. And Elizabeth Johnson is with us, the activist mommy. Good to see you. Thank you so much. It's an honor. Hey, listen, what happened in North Carolina? You bring that stuff out, and the Obama administration tried to force the same-sex bathrooms. And well, what was the whole uh, crux of that thing? Yeah, the transgender uh, directive, bathroom directive from Obama is actually kind of what rocketed me out of my church pew yeah. and onto the front lines of the battle. I was very concerned when I knew that, you know, grown men were going to be able to access the locker rooms, shower rooms, bathrooms of our little daughters. I no longer recognized my country. Well, what, what, what was he doing? What was the, uh, what uh, constitutional ground did he have to make, issue such a decree? He did not, and did. Uh, unfortunately, governors did not push back as strongly as they should have. They started with with rhetoric um, to to uh, push back against the tyrannical uh, decree that he made about these bathrooms, but he had no constitutional grounds. And uh, we're still dealing with the ramifications from you, that. You point out there was a security guard who arrested a man for going into a woman's uh, um, bathroom because she violated some right that he had under the Obama administration. Tell us about that. Yeah, that was the night that I was gripped with a fear that was truly uncommon to me. I, when I read that news story and realized that we are siding with mentally disturbed individuals mm -hmm. over, uh, you know, perfectly normal individuals who desire to be kept safe in their private places and they're safe, you know, safe in their spaces like bathrooms. I thought, um, you know, we, we truly have lost our way. Wrong is right and right is wrong. And, and we don't have to tolerate this. And so, you know, my book is filled with um, inspirational stories sure. uh, about uh, things that, that we have been able to do. We've, I'm just a simple mom uh, yeah. with 10 children, a homeschool mom. I'm a very ordinary individual. Uh, don't have any law degree. I'm not a politician, not a doctor. And, um, you know, we've been able to shut down sex brothels and give Teen uh, Vogue a black eye they were unable to recover from, um, fight pornographic sex ed, started a global movement to fight pornographic sex ed Tell last about year. This pornographic sex ed. You pointed out they teach oral sex, anal sex, all this kind of horrible stuff in schools. It's still hard for me to even hear, hear those words uttered. Yes, sir. Uh, last year on April 23rd, we did sex ed sit out where in droves we sat out of the public school schools because they are teaching gender bending pornographic sex ed. You're right. That is what they are teaching. And the kids are being taught to question their gender gender as young as five years old. This is not what we send our children well, to school for. They, who, who is they? Who well, 
actually Planned Parenthood and Human Rights Campaign, two of the largest political lobbies in our nation, are in our public schools teaching these things. How, how pervasive is that? Extremely pervasive, but thanks to Sex Ed Sit Out and all that we have done to rally the parents and educate them on oh. this, parents are starting to uh, confront this in their schools and go to their administrators. You, you have a little kid, he's five or six years old, they're trying to tell him he, he's a girl or he should be a boy or he's a boy, he should be a girl. Yeah, it's a perfectly normal, healthy option, they say. Uh, they are absolutely um, uh, wreaking confusion and havoc on this generation. They are uh, cultural, radical cultural Marxists who have every intention of changing the fabric of our nation and ensuring that our children do not hold our values. That is why I am a huge homeschool advocate mm -hmm. um, and would encourage all parents, if, if in any way possible, please bring your children home and educate them and keep them safe from these radical Marxists. You have a list of things in here that parents who do have children in public schools can do. What are some of the things they can do? A you, really, you really have read my book. Yeah, I'm impressed. I, I, I do that. <laughs> I, I'm one of the few TV hosts who reads the books. <laughs> yes, I do. I do have a very practical list of advice in the book. If you are going to allow your children to be in the public schools, uh, at least I'd like to assist parents in keeping their children safe from these radical Marxists and ensuring that their children can grow up with their Christian values. You talk about uh, Planned Parenthood. I've, I've uh, crossed swords with Margaret Sanger. That mm -hmm. She read a, a monograph I read called Braiding the Thoroughbred. And tell me, I mean, she was the founder of Planned Parenthood. Planned Parenthood gets a lot of money from the federal government, gets a lot of money from the states. Well, tell us what she believed. Yep, uh, Margaret Sanger was a racist and believed in Hitler-esque eugenics. She believed that uh, black people and Jews were weeds that um, that needed to be disposed of, and that is why you see abortion clinics purposefully planted in um, in minority neighborhoods. Unfortunately, this issue of abortion is something that our black pastors should be front and center on, and that is why. Pat, we are organizing something huge right now. What? This Saturday, the day of mourning is being held across this nation. We are calling America to repent over the 46 years of bloodshed. We're asking Americans to wear black, mm -hmm. to not shop, to close down your businesses for the day, and to repent for the sin of abortion. You know the Benham brothers? Um, we, we have them speaking, black conservative David J. Harris will be speaking. We're holding a flagship, a huge flagship rally that's already sold out in Albany, New York, Pat, right in the epicenter of where uh, Governor Cuomo signed and celebrated that outrageous infanticide law. We're going to be right there in the convention center underneath the state house where they signed that law. And we are we are owning this sin. Even as God's people, if you've never committed an abortion, there's a sense in which we have been completely complicit, completely silent. We have not been the good Samaritan that we must be. And so we have to own this as God's people for allowing this bloodshed for 46 years. And we're going to get on our faces before God thousands of people and repent for the sin of what abortion. What they're doing now is not just abortion, it is partial birth, and it's even infanticide, isn't it? I mean, the children are born, if, 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 if a botched abortion and the child is born alive, they're supposed to kill it. Is that, are those laws prohibiting things like that? The, the real story here, think, I think, is that as God's people, we're outraged over a baby that is being murdered at 40 weeks, yeah. but we have not grieved over the baby's that are being aborted at nine weeks gestation. Mm -hmm. And so there's a bigotry even amongst God's people against these younger babies. We're, we're not doing really anything to rescue these children. There's a discrimination against these babies based upon their age. And we're saying, no, you know what? We don't need less abortion. We need it to end altogether. We need no abortion, no child murder. And we are going to join together. If you'll go to day, if your viewers will go to dayofmourning.org, they will see that there are 24 cities now live streaming our event on the 23rd. And we, are, we want your audience to be a part of this great movement of God to repent over the sin of abortion. Uh, they have put out the lie that a mother that has a baby, she's doing something wrong, that she's contributing to of the overpopulation, and you pointed out uh, how many acres there are in this land. There's plenty of space for all yeah. the children. 
Yes, the overpopulation is is uh, an obvious myth. My daughter and I were just commenting as we were traveling um, th through around the New York area how congested it was in the city of New York, but how you know so much of the rest of our nation is sure. is of course not congested and and uh, so uninhabited in many places. And yeah, this is part of the agenda again to uh, snuff out God's God's seed. Why do you think they embrace Islam so much? Islam is anti-feminist if there ever was anything. Yeah, it absolutely is. The hypocrisy on the left and the radical feminist agenda embracing women like Linda Sarsour, mm -hmm. uh, who advocates for Sharia law, um, it is mind-boggling. I think anything that uh, opposes Christianity and wants to snuff out Christianity mm -hmm. is something that the radical left wants to get behind. And we know, of course, uh, Islam wants to see the, the end of Christianity. You think we can win? Absolutely. Right. If we won't be bullied and if we won't fear the left and if we will allow God to uh, to make us bold and courageous, we absolutely can win this fight. Well, Elizabeth, thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, not on my watch. This is a tough book. Some of the things that are being taught in the schools will horrify you. And what Margaret Sanger wanted will horrify you even more. Black genocide is what she wanted. She wanted to do away with Southern uh, uh, Europeans, she wanted to do away with black people, she wanted to do away with the mentally defective, and she didn't learn from Hitler, Hitler learned from her. That's the thing you've got to remember. Mm. Wow. wow. Tremendous. Thank you, Elizabeth. God bless you. Thank you so much. Keep it up, and our prayers are with you. Praise God. Thank All you. All right, Terry, what's next? Well, up next, a cop who was on the wrong end of a drug sting. Very humiliating to go from one extreme to the next extreme. It was the beginning of the fall for me. Find out what happens when the long arm of the law came looking for him when we come back. Well, welcome back. You're watching The 700 Club, and we've got a whole lot of interesting things left for you, including this next story. When Officer Anthony Bryant wasn't busting bad guys. He was helping them run drugs across town. And after several years of the force, Anthony was being hunted himself by the FBI. And soon he wasn't going to lock people up. He was heading for prison to pay for his crimes. And I heard this knock on the door. That's the knock of law enforcement. And they say, we have a warrant for your arrest. Anthony Bryant never thought much about growing up in the projects of Savannah, Georgia, or that his family was poor. His parents were devout Christians who took their eight children to church every week. They worked hard to make sure they had enough to get by. Then in high school, Anthony saw another side of life when I began to wanting to date girls that were not from the project area, I began to notice that, hey, there's a big major difference. I got to do better. He worked hard in school, hoping it would open doors to success. Then in his senior year, he got his girlfriend pregnant and married her. Needing a job, he followed his older brother's example and enlisted in the Army. He earned a position of trust handling highly classified information. It was a boost to his self-confidence and his ego. I took great pride in that uniform. Kept it in pristine condition. That power came in and it was just unreal. Eight years later, he traded in his fatigues for a new uniform with the police department in Chatham County, Georgia. Again, following in his brother's footsteps. But soon, his brother and his family were the last people on his mind. Failure definitely wasn't an option. My focus is my job, going to the next level professionally, and just being self-absorbed with Anthony. Anthony became an exemplary officer. With his success came respect, accolades, and pride. But his focus on reputation came at a price as his personal life began to suffer. I'm still a good provider, but just not a good husband. As you build up power, you build up ego. You build up ego, you build up self-reliance on you. His self-absorption led to having affairs and living a double life. 
It was all appearances. You play the part, you show up for work, you do your job, and if you do it really well, then you, no one is going to question it. They're going to question it at all. Sometime later, his older brother had a proposition to escort some drug runners through town. But Anthony never worried about getting caught because in his mind, he was untouchable. You have that Superman complex, can't happen to you, and you begin to justify things within your mind. I looked up to him and, and felt a type of allegiance towards him to say, okay, I'll do it. 30-year-old Anthony Bryant is admitting that he attempted to aid and abet the distribution of cocaine. Very humiliating. It's just indescribable to know that you go from one extreme to the next extreme. It was the beginning of the fall for me. Awaiting sentencing, Anthony decided to give his life to Christ, but on one condition. Now I'm going to try this God that my mom raised me in. OK, God, I gave my life to you. Now don't allow me to go to prison. Two months later, he was sitting in a cell with a 12-year prison sentence. But Anthony couldn't understand why. God, you did not hear anything I said. My kids are going to grow up without their dad. My wife at that time, you know, within a year, she filed for divorce. So I'm like, no, I'm done cashing out. Suicide, suicide. For weeks, he hoarded aspirin from the infirmary and other inmates. I was just going to take them all and just go to sleep and never wake up again. That was my plan. I heard this voice. The voice said, look under the mattress. And I pulled up the mattress, and I saw this Bible. It took me that scripture where it talks about better is the ending of a thing than the beginning. Finally, he understood that it wasn't all about him and said, you know, God, I've tried it my way, and I failed. And I flushed all those pills down the toilet. And I can focus on doing what you need me to do while I'm in here. Anthony spent the rest of his time in prison studying scripture, leading prayer groups, and sharing his testimony. Since his release in 2008, he's continued to pursue the Lord and gives back to his community. I teach ethics and responsibility classes to law enforcement, and through that, I used my personal testimony. That moment when I gave my life to him, it was, it was a true transformation. Uh, God began to start working in my life even then. I can see where now God has placed me on even a higher platform. But the difference now is uh, with him, I know how to exercise humility. God has definitely done a mighty work in my life. And um, you know, I'm, I'm grateful. The Bible says God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. And Anthony was proud. He was a big to shot. He was a law enforcement man. Nobody could touch him because he was one of the best there was. Oh, there's so many people who are proud. You're so proud of what you've done, of who you are, of the position you hold. You have authority. You have money. You have prestige. There's so many things. But God can pull it all down in an instant. When if you get too proud, he resists the proud. He gives grace to the humble. Now I ask you today, will you humble yourself before the Lord? You know, there was a man who stood before God and he said, God, I thank you. I'm not like these other guys. I fast, I give a tithe, I'm this, that, and the other, and I'm so good. And another man beat his chest, and he wouldn't even look up to God, and he said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And the Lord said, that man went home justified. The other didn't. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. So some of you right now watching this program, if you feel proud that you're some kind of something, just remember that God Almighty that created this world looks down from heaven, and he says, you know, child, I formed you, I made you. Are you going to submit to me, and you, will you humble yourself before me? 
humble yourself before the mighty hand of God, and he will exalt you in due season, is what the Bible says. I want you to pray with me right now and say these words and mean them in your heart. Lord God, I confess to you right now that I am a sinner and I need salvation. And I come to you humbly and I ask you to come into my heart, live your life in me. And from this moment on, I will live for you and I will serve you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, if you prayed with me just then, I want you to tell somebody about it. I think it's important that you confess what you've done. The Bible talks about confessing with your mouth the Lord Jesus. And if you do that, I want you to go to your telephone right now and just tell one of these operators, look, I just prayed with Pat. I gave my heart to the Lord. And the angels of heaven are rejoicing over this decision. I want to give you something that will help you. It's a CD that I did a few years ago. But it's got the principles, about 73 minutes of intense teaching about what you have done and what it means to be a new creature in Christ. I'll give this to you free. All you got to do is just call in. It's 1-800-700-7000. It's easy to remember. And all you have to do is call. There's no financial obligation whatsoever. Just say, look, I just came to the Lord. I just want to share with you. And there's somebody on the phone who will rejoice over this decision you've just made. Terry? Still ahead, the former evangelist in residence at the Billy Graham Center, who has taken the gospel to three million people across 12 countries. For his glories, Rob Welch joins us live, so don't go away. Welcome to Washington for this CBN News Break. President Trump is calling out Venezuela's Nicolas Maduro. At a rally in Florida, the president said the U.S. stands with interim President Juan Guaido, who was appointed by the country's legislature. It contends Maduro stole the most recent election. Trump called on Venezuela's military to back Guaido and issued a warning to those who continue to support Maduro. If you choose this path, you will find no safe harbor, no easy exit, and no way out. You will lose everything. The weeks-long standoff has only worsened an already terrible humanitarian crisis in Venezuela. Maduro has used the military to block international aid from entering the country. While the head of the Southern Baptist Convention is calling for a season of lament for what he describes as decades of inaction on the issue of sexual abuse, he's also calling for no tolerance for churches that try to cover it up. Monday night, SBC President J.D. Greer called for the denomination to scrutinize and possibly remove 10 churches, including Houston's Second Baptist, for their handling of sexual abuse. In his annual address, Greer told Baptist leaders, this is a gospel moment. If we don't get this right, our churches will not be a safe place for the lost. Well, you can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website at CBNNews.com. Pat and Terry will be back with more of the 700 Club right after this. In 2002, Rob Welch sold his home, left his job, and surrendered to God's call on his life. It was a leap of faith for sure, and it was one that has led to a half a million people committing their lives to Christ. While training at the Billy Graham Center in 2004, Rob Welch decided to help churches promote, train, and equip new believers. Since 2006, he started using large festivals to do just that. God has led us to minister in cities with hundreds of churches where the church leaders are seeking God to transform their cities and their region and their nation with the gospel. Since then, he's held these meetings in 12 countries with more than 500,000 people making decisions for Christ. Rob Welch is here with us now, and Rob, we welcome you to the program today. Thank you. Talk a bit, if you will, about what compelled you to leave the successful business career and move into ministry. Well, it was clearly the Lord because I had other plans. <laughs> I, 
<laughs> I uh, left one sales position. I was starting to wonder if God might be calling me to ministry. And I said, Lord, if you want me to go in the ministry, I will, but you got to make it really clear because I got bills to pay. <laughs> and God didn't immediately open the door, but a couple months later, a missionary couple on their first furlough from Western China were talking about reaching a totally unreached wow. people. And uh, the missionary was talking about Romans 10. How will they hear? unless they have a preacher and how will somebody preach to him unless he's sent and God lit a fire and over the next 10 months God confronted me with my four biggest idols and in essence asked me is this your God or am I wow. and finally uh, he brought me to my Isaac and I had to lay that down on the altar and surrender to him and and there was really nothing else to do when God calls you the best thing you could do is just say yes <laughs> yes Lord and uh, I surrendered to his call in October of, of 2001 and wow. never looked back. You actually were studying a world map and you had a vision. Yeah, I really felt the Lord say to me, one world, one Lord, one gospel. And I didn't know the fullness of that at the time, but I sensed that I was at my church where I was ordained in and uh, I was looking at the map there and, and God just put that on my heart. and. He's been showing me what that means more and more since then. <laughs> was that on your heart when you first surrendered and made your commitment to leave business and go into ministry? Did you have any idea the scope of what God was calling you no, to? No, I really didn't. I thought I was going to be a missionary. And so when I surrendered to his call, I thought I was going to be a missionary in Africa. And I, I went back to school at Wheaton College uh, to get my master's in missions, again, thinking I'm going to the mission field. And while I was finishing there, I went to a prison in Florida and I preached. And the first time I preached, there were like 80 guys in the room. It's at a work camp. And I'm preaching on John 14, where Jesus said, I'm the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And when I gave the call, it was like the room came forward. This first guy got up and leaped out of his seat, almost came running. 44 of the 80 guys came forward, wow. surrendered to Christ. And over the next three days, you know, God just had his hand on me. I'm, I'm just a mouthpiece up there. My role is just be surrendered, show up and just let God speak. And so God just showed me that then. And I knew from that point forward, I'd be starting and leading a ministry like Billy Graham's, the, the large uh, festivals and seeing God just move in great power. So that was in, in March of 2004 that he confirmed my call. The pictures call. that we're looking at of the crowds are, are massive. I, I know just from a, a citywide crusade in the United States, because I, I had the privilege of speaking at one of Billy's crusades in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, the kind of prep that goes into doing that. It's not like you just show up in town one day, hang up a few posters <laughs> and, and bada boom, you know. You got that right. So talk about what kind of prep you do, because you're really talking not just about not just about sharing the gospel and seeing people come forward, but about discipling as well. Yeah, our whole focus is on launching movements. And so there's a lot that goes into the festival itself and getting uh, hundreds of churches together. But our whole focus is on launching movements. So we're training and equipping believers to multiply. There are multiple trips in advance, yeah. equipping thousands of believers uh, to do small group discipleship. So it's what you see in the book of Acts. So there, there are three advanced trips where we're doing that, a lot of advanced work. And then you see a huge harvest. The last mission, we had over 100,000 wow. uh, receive Christ. So we got decision cards for it. We didn't have enough counselors, because when you have 130,000 people there and over 100,000 raise their hand, it, yeah. it's real hard to get to them all. But, uh, but the whole focus is on launching movements. So there's so much prep and there's so much that goes into the festival as well. As, uh, as you've moved forward with what God's called you to and you're seeing the masses come and you're seeing the response of people, have churches been receptive to, because once, once it's over, the church needs to rise up and disciple these yeah. people. Have you seen a, a positive in that? Yes, we have. The last little over three years, Terry, we've uh, seen movements birth. The, the cities we've gone to since the fall of 2015, we've seen movements started. And so we let the pastors know at the very beginning, the focus is not on the event. It's not on the festival. It's on launching a multiplying movement that will be self-sustained. So they know that the festival is really the launching pad. It's not the finish line. And then there are trips afterwards as well. And we have a leadership team on the ground 
that the local pastors select to lead the training. Awesome. So the multiplication is going on before the festival and we get new believers in the small groups and to be discipled. And once you get to the fourth generation, you got a movement launched and you can literally see millions of people come to faith in Christ. Um, and not just here in the United States, God has taken you as we've seen in these pictures around the world, really. Talk a little bit about Congo because you know, if I if I had to make a list of a couple of places that I probably wouldn't be that comfortable going to, Congo would be on that list. I think it would be. <laughs> uh, there are some other countries too, but yeah, uh, Congo is just really ripe, and it's not a trip where we bring large teams. Mm -hmm. Logistically, there's some issues. Security-wise, there's some issues. Yeah. There's a ton of unrest, but it is so hungry and so ripe for the gospel. And this was my third time there. Um, you know, going. And so I've been there before, but it, it, it was so ripe and so ready. And when you're an evangelist and you're a harvester, you want to go where the fields are the ripest. Yeah. So I want to go to those hurting, those broken places where people are desperate for God and they know that only God can deliver them. Those are the places that are most ready to receive the message. So with that in mind, what what's ahead? What do you see? <laughs> well, leave, well, next we leave in, in nine days uh, for Tanzania on our next mission. And I see God doing great things. We're going to a city right by Mount Kilimanjaro, Moshi, a small city working with about 110, 120 churches. And wow. I think we'll see 75, 80,000 people respond and, wow. and get them in the discipleship groups and see a movement birth there. And later in the year, we're going back to Congo, Lord willing. And yeah. I think we're going to see just a huge harvest there. But see more of that. We're looking at seeing God transform nations for Christ. Amen. God's given me faith for a billion souls. And, and it's all through movements being launched. So we want to share this with everyone we can to see the multiplication of the kingdom. God's given us a vision. He's doing it. It's multiplying. We're seeing more and more. It's just a matter of walking with him faithfully and he's opening the doors. And it's just awesome. You know, you've yes, seen it in your yes, life. Yes, but, but you're launching it. <laughs> well, God's That's doing very it. very exciting. We're just, we're just the mouthpieces and the yes. catalyst. If God doesn't do it, nothing's going to happen. Absolutely. And it's his hand on us that's doing it. But the pastors and the believers Believers are really catching the vision, and it's about activating every believer to fulfill mm -hmm. their calling. And when they realize, wait, God can use me too, not Absolutely. just the preacher, not just the pastor, I can be used. Yeah. It excites them, it enlivens them, and it strengthens and multiplies the church and awesome. advances the kingdom. It's so exciting to hear about. Well, if you want to know more about For His Glory Ministries, go to CBN.com. And Rob, we thank you for being with us, and we watch enthusiastically, we support, we pray for all that you're doing. It's a blessing. Blessing. Thank you Big so blessing. much. Still ahead, time for another round of your questions, honest answers. Julie says, my church is teaching about Enneagrams. Is this a cult? That's going to weigh in on that more when we return. When Josue and Gadiel arrived in an orphanage in Mexico, all the brothers had were each other. Today, they're as close as ever, but they also have friends, play sports, and get to pl eat plenty. And it's all thanks to people just like you. When I first met Josue and Gadil, I quickly realized they are both brothers and best friends. They've taken care of each other since they came to this children's home in Mexico. When we got here, all of a sudden, I had toys and friends to play with. That brought us here. My brother helps me with my homework, and I help him with his math. Everyone gets along really well. We like to play soccer and hide and seek. We care for children that have suffered abuse, have been abandoned, or are orphans. With 40 children, we serve 160 meals each day. It is a daily struggle. That's why CBN's Orphans Promise gave the children 100 chickens. Josue and Gadil both stepped up and took on the responsibility of taking care of the chickens, and they're doing a great job. My brother taught me how to feed and carry the chickens without hurting them. I really like that. Every day, these chickens are laying between 60 and 70 eggs. That's more than enough for all of the kids here. And the extra eggs get sold in the local market. The brothers invited me into the corral to show me how they feed the chickens. Next up, 
egg hunt. Finding them is a serious task for the kids. They count them all and then take them to the kitchen. When the meal was ready, Josue and Gadil wanted a ride to the cafeteria. I feel happy that my friends are eating the eggs that we find. They are delicious. With all the added protein, these guys are growing up to be big and strong. And thanks to CBN Partners, the kids here are receiving more than a good meal. This project is a blessing. Children get involved taking care of them. They learn the value of work and they get to eat something natural and healthy. I am happy that you came to visit us. Thank you. <laughs> Josue and Gadil represent all of the children at that home, and they represent all of the children around the world whose lives you're touching. One of the things I love about this story is the obvious dignity that you see that has been given to these children. They are a part of the answer there. They're learning things that will help them to live productive adult lives, learning about the love of God, and at the same time, in a safe place, being fed, schooling. It's all because of your kindness and generosity, and we say thank you. Join the 700 Club today. You can make such a difference. 65 cents a day, $20 a month. Our number's toll free, so easy to join. 1-800-700-7000. And when you call and join, we're going to send you the I Wills of God. This is Pat's latest teaching from Psalm 91. It's so inspiring, so important. You need to know what the Word of God has to say to you in this psalm particularly. So call now. Change the lives of kids around the world, and we'll send you something that will bless your life as well. Ready for some email? All right, let's lay it on me. Let's go. Okay, this first one comes from Julie, who says, Pat, my church has about 20,000 attendees. Lead pastors are teaching and preaching and directing the congregation about Enneagrams. They've been focusing the sermons on Enneagrams and not God. This does not feel right in my spirit. Is my church preaching and teaching the occult? Please advise. Uh, yes, it is. It's a, it's a syncretistic uh, type of thing that draws on uh, all kinds of religious beliefs, but it's, it's new age and it's not uh, of the Bible. And uh, uh, I, I don't know why any pastor would do that. You know, I think of that church that had a seekers church. You remember that? They had 20,000 or so members and all of a sudden the pastor said, I can't take this anymore. I'm not, I'm not really uh, doing what I ought to be. And uh, you know, so anyhow, uh, what do you do about a situation like that? I, I think if I were you, I'd, I'd run to the quickest exit and really? get, get out. Get, yeah, that integram, I mean, you don't want to get involved in a new age cult, and that's what it is, okay? Well, every church should be preaching from the Word, shouldn't they? Well, of course yeah. they should. It ought to be the Bible. This is not biblical. Okay, Elizabeth wants to know, is kissing someone who you aren't married to a sin? <laughs> well, you know, I was reading... Uh, in Proverbs, uh, it said uh, uh, a word uh, fitly spoken or something is like a kiss on the lips. I mean, you know, I mean, there's certain cultures, everybody kisses. The men kiss each other and they, you know, they, they kiss, kiss. Both cheeks and stuff. Uh, cheek, cheek, everybody, you know, cheek and, and you know. I, I don't think it's a sin, but be careful. I mean, if it, get, if it leads to something else, that's a different matter. But, right. you know, but... Uh, you know, the Bible says, greet one another with a holy kiss. I don't know whether he was talking about on lips or on the cheeks or whatever, but <laughs> it's, it's, it's Middle Eastern pretty much. So is it a sin? Not really. It depends on what you're doing. Okay. This is Jessica who says, is there a difference between fallen angels and demons? Do they have different powers or is one stronger than the other? No, I, I think a fallen angel, they call them evil spirits. They call them demons. Uh, but a fallen angel is what they're, they're dealing with. I mean, when Satan was cast out of heaven, he, he took a lot of people with him, a lot of beings with him. They're angels. And... Uh, Hell is going to be uh, available for them later on, but th that's who they got, all right? This is a viewer who says, I'm a 33-year-old female that is not getting any younger. I was wondering if it's okay to donate my eggs to a family that can't have kids, or can I myself do artificial insemination without being married? Uh, I'm not sure that you're able to do artificial insemination, but 
I, I don't see anything wrong with donating a, a, an egg or a fertilized egg to an infertile couple so they can have a child. But there are all kinds of paternity issues. And there's all kinds of emotional issues that, that result. So be aware that you're, you're, you're getting into some difficult problems. But I, I frankly see nothing about it in the Bible because they didn't have that kind of technology in the Bible. But uh, it, it seems to me it would be a, a gracious thing to do, just like donating a kidney or mm -hmm. uh, some organ. Yes. You know? But this is a complicated one. I'll read this quickly. Casey wants to know, I'm seeking help in what I should do about a situation. My fiancé of four years has admitted to having impure thoughts and urges toward my 11-year-old daughter who's from a previous marriage. He's depressed about this, and I'm sick to my stomach. What should I do? Where do I seek help and counseling? Is there hope, or should I leave? Well, you certainly should leave. He's obviously yeah. a pedophile, and that, that, that's the kind of thing. I mean, good grief, you don't want to expose your children to that kind of an influence. So that's horrible. But uh, they're, they're, you don't want to get the man arrested. Uh, I think you say, where do well, I he find He hasn't him? done anything at this point. He hasn't point, done right. anything, and I, he's just got tendencies. But I think he needs counseling, and he needs to get delivered from this. But this is a serious thing. But do you want to continue a relationship with somebody like that? The answer is no. Mm -hmm. We leave you with today's power minute from Ephesians. For he himself is our peace. Tomorrow, have Israeli scientists discovered the cure for cancer? Well, they say they're close to eradicating that disease. What a wonderful breakthrough, and God bless Israel. They're, God intended them to be a blessing in the midst of the nations, and this is just one more evidence of it. Well, thanks for being with us, for Terry and all of us. This is Pat Robertson, and Lord willing, we'll see you at the same time tomorrow. Bye-bye.